from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to take my text from my new book. It's found Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made a choice. Joshua voted. Now, Joshua had led the people of Israel after the death of Moses. He was a great general. And now, at the end of his life, he's called all the people together at Shechem. Now, Shechem was between two mountains. One was the mountain of law, and the other one was another mountain. And between those two mountains, they gathered. Now, the history of Israel was always up and down. For a little while, they'd serve the Lord, and then they would fall back in their old ways and go to their old idols. And in this case, it was Baal. And he was telling them, you've got to make a choice. It's between Baal and God. Which is it going to be? Who do you vote for? You know, we have old proverbs. I suppose you have them here in North Florida. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Now, they made decisions, and they cast their votes, no matter what the cost was, because of what they believed. And Joshua said, I'm calling my family together, and we're voting for God. We're going to serve the true and the living God. Now, outwardly, the followers of God, but deep in their hearts, they were idolatrous. And Joshua says that such a condition cannot continue. You must decide whether you're going to worship those idols or worship the living God. And they must decide immediately. That was Israel's day of election, Israel's day of decision. They must go on record for God or against him. And you must decide tonight. There are hundreds of people here tonight that have to decide tonight. And your decision tonight, yes or no, will decide where you'll be a hundred years from now. Because you see, only one God can occupy the throne of your heart. The Scripture says, The first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, we have idolatry today in subtle ways. Our actors and actresses and academics many times and even athletes can very easily, subtly become our gods. Richard Phelps wrote in Time magazine in September with regard to the cocaine deaths of sports superstars, he said, the trouble is that Americans tend to think of athletes as godlike beings. And sometimes that is true. We make too much of some of the young players, and these young players sometimes just cannot take it, and they crack up because it takes experience and maturity to take all the money and all the fame so suddenly at such a young age. And Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. But regardless of what the people did, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care if the whole outfit turns against God. I don't care if all of you turn to idolatry. My house and me, we're going to serve the true and the living God. Have you ever said that? Have you ever said, I'm going to serve Christ no matter what my peers think or what my classmates think or what the people that wor I work with think or my neighbors? Robert Browning exclaimed a hundred years ago, this business of life is made up of terrible choices. And it is. We have to make some of these choices in our lives. Adam had to make that choice. Was he going to build his world with God and have peace in the world and justice in the world? Or was he going to go his own way? He decided to go his own way and to listen to the devil. And he led the whole world astray. The rich young ruler came to Jesus wanting to find some spiritual help. And Jesus said, all right, would you like to have eternal life? 
Well, the rich young ruler said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, if you want eternal life, you do this and this and this and this. The rich young ruler left sadly because he couldn't pay the price, and Jesus would not bargain with him. Every person that ever lived has to make the same choice. It's either the world and its pleasures and its gods or it's Christ. Which is it for you? Now, first, we must choose two ways of life, between two ways. The prophet I, Jeremiah wrote, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Which road are you on? Jesus Christ said, I am the way. I am the way. Come to Christ. He will give you a new strength and a new power and a new joy and a new peace and a purpose for living. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, the Bible says, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It looks right, that road you're on. The path you've chosen looks right. It looks so good. That business you're in, that school you're in looks so good. But one of these days, unless you're committed to Christ and in the will of God, you'll soon find out that you're on the wrong road. Some people say, well, if I follow my conscience, isn't that enough? No, because your conscience can be dead. Many people have a dead conscience. But when you come to Jesus Christ, he resensitizes the conscience. You see, you, you, you tell a lie when you're a child and your conscience bothers you. Now you can look a person straight in the face and tell a lie and it doesn't bother you at all. There was a time when you do some other things that bother you, now you can do it and it doesn't bother you. You say, well, that's not so bad then. Your conscience doesn't bother you. Why? Because your conscience has been seared or it's dead. But when you come to Christ, he gives you a new conscience so that you can be sensitive to those things that are wrong. People say, well, being sincere, if I'm sincere in life, isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. You can be sincere. My mother was very sincere one time when I was sick, and she gave me some iodine by mistake. She thought she was giving me cough medicine, but it was wrong, sincerely wrong. Or they say, well, if I, I, I do so, so many good things for people, and I smile at people, and I'm friendly with people, don't you think God understands if I commit a little sin now and again, and he'll understand. He's a good God. He's a loving God and all that. No, God doesn't understand. If you know Christ, then those sins are forgiven. But you see, we are not saved by our goodness and our own works. I've come from a country, France, where many people think that they're saved by, being, by their good works. They've been taught that since childhood as a part of religion. But you're not saved by good works. You're saved by the grace of God, for by grace are we saved through faith in that, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I was saved by my own goodness, I'd get up to heaven and walk around and brag and say, look what I did to get here. I was a good boy. But we're all sinners. None of us deserve to be in heaven. God says that we're to be as holy as he is. I can't be as holy as God. So what happens? Christ came and died on the cross and shed his blood to provide for me a holiness that I do not naturally have. And he provides a clothe, a cloth of holiness for me and righteousness that I don't deserve. Then there are people who say, well, I reformed. Yes, you can reform the rest of your life, but that's not it. You must come to Christ and you must enter the narrow gate and walk the narrow road. So there's a choice that you have. You have to vote one life or the other. Which will it be? A life of surrender to Christ as Lord and Savior or a life in which you surrender to yourself and your own desires and your own pleasures and your own lust and your own greed and your own jealousies. And then you have to make a choice between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. You have to make a choice. It's either self or Christ. Which will it be? Not only two ways of life, not only two masters, 
but also you have to choose between two destinies. What is your destiny? Where will you be 50, 100 years from tonight? You'll be somewhere, the real you. Your body will be in the grave perhaps, but you, the real you, your soul, your spirit, the thing that thinks and remembers and loves and so forth, that's the part of you that will live forever, either in heaven or hell, and you've got to make a choice between the two. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, used to emphasize that no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ, and he was right. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with such clarity and authority as did Jesus Christ. One of television's most popular programs during the last year has been entitled Highway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the highway to heaven. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. We win uh, Romania last year holding meetings and and there were thousands of people as far as you could see. And they took me into a place called Moldavia. And they took us on a little sightseeing tour up into the hills and the mountains and so forth. And they took us to churches and buildings that were painted about a thousand years ago with a kind of paint that has never lost its glow and its color. And they don't know how they did it. They think maybe they used honey, but they don't, they're not sure. And all the paintings are religious paintings because the people didn't have any Bibles and they didn't have any uh, Christian literature and they had no way of telling the story of the Bible. So they taught the Bible with paintings on the sides of buildings. And you can see the whole Bible story. And I saw one painting in beautiful blue and the various colors that had lasted a thousand years and I thought to myself, look at that. It was a picture of a ladder that was going from the fires of hell up to where Jesus was at the top of the ladder in paradise. And down below were demons all the way up that ladder, pulling at them, pulling at them, trying to get them into the flames. Then over them were the angels helping them along up that ladder. And I thought that's a little bit like it might be distorted. It may not be theologically exactly right, but they had the idea because there is a constant battle for your soul going on all the time. You see, your soul is important to the devil. He wants your soul. He'll pay any price. And some of you are selling your soul so cheaply. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The devil will give you the whole world if you'll follow him. But some of you will follow him and he won't give you anything. You just follow him because you don't, you're like the pig that's following the man that's dropping the beans, going to the slaughter pen. Every little bit he drops a bean and the pig goes <coughs> following right along. And you don't even think that you're following the devil in the wrong direction. Yes, Jesus Christ is the highway to heaven. But be aware, no man cometh to the Father but by me, he said. And then this choice or this vote that you make has got to be yourself. You must make that vote yourself. For as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know one, I guess one of the year's most popular songs is Madonna's Papa Don't Preach. Now Joshua didn't hesitate for one moment to preach to those people. He said, as for me and my house, he was voting for Christ, for God. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. He had to choose for himself. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within us where we retire from all of the fellowship, all of the influences. There's a lonely arena in the depths of your heart where the greatest battle of life must be fought alone. That's your decision about Christ. Your parents can't make it for you. The church can't make it for you. Your friends can't make it for you. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend can't make it for you. You have to make it yourself. You must make the commitment. One of the popular songs according to Billboard is entitled Lonely Alone. And how true that is. Lonely Alone. 
and it's in that part of you. And when you voted, you yourself had to cast your own vote. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I've said before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. You choose life that you and your seed may live. It affects future generations. It affects your children and your grandchildren. A decision that my grandfathers made years ago affects my life today. We read that a generation earlier, Moses had chosen Christ. And the writer to the Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. He could have been commander in chief of the armies of Egypt, or he might have been the Pharaoh. All the education, all the wealth of Egypt was his. He turned his back on all of it to suffer with the people of God. He chose God. Who are you choosing? Who are you voting for? choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Oh, yes, there's pleasure in sin for a short time, but it's soon over. The hangover comes, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to be there. Choose Christ, and there'll never be a hangover except joy and peace. That doesn't mean that he'll deliver you from all your troubles and problems and trials because that will go on and on. But they may be different. God allows them. That's a part of our maturing process. That's how God trains us. But down deep inside is a deep river of joy and peace in the midst of the life that you're living. Now, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. But Christ can change your past. He died on the cross so that all the sins you've ever committed, all the things you've ever done wrong are forgiven. And when God says they're forgiven, he means more than we mean. He means justification. That means just as if you had never committed any sin at all. That's the power of the blood of Christ that we heard him singing about a while ago. I know my sins are under the blood. And the choice involves a price. The apostle Peter wrote, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the pre precious blood of Christ. The price that Jesus paid on the cross when he shed his life blood for you. Martin Luther once said, the founder of, I suppose, the Reformation and the founder of, we could say, almost one of the founders of Protestantism and certainly of the Lutheran churches. He said, when I look at myself, I don't know how I can be saved, but when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I could be lost. John Calvin, who founded Reformed Theology in one sense, and the Presbyterian Church said, upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, I hang my whole eternity. I hang it on Jesus. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, when he lay dying, said, my mind is almost gone. I can remember only two things. I'm a great sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior. Christ is a great Savior. What do you have to do? You have to repent of your sins. That means to be willing to change your way of living. You may have no power to do it. You may not have power to give up some of those habits you know are wrong. You may not have power to fall in love with your wife again. You may not have power to change your whole life that you know needs to be changed. But if you surrender to Christ, he'll give you the power. You say, well, Billy, I don't know what else to do. I've been baptized, I joined the church and so forth, but I don't really have peace and joy and power in my life, all that you're talking about. How do I get it? If you're not sure that you're ready to meet God, if you're not sure you're going to heaven and you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, you come and make sure tonight. I believe that none of you are here by accident tonight. I believe that you're here on this particular night because this is the night that you are to meet God in a new way and receive him into your heart. And it's an urgent decision because to delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision in itself is a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. If you have a ticket for a flight to Atlanta tonight and can't decide whether to go or not, if you wait past the departure time, the choice will have been made. 
the plane will take off without you. Decisions are made whether we make them or not. Time decides if you will not, and time always decides against you. Joel said, put you in the har sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now is the accepted time, the Bible says. Come now while you can. You may not have a chance tomorrow. Today is the day to cast your vote totally for Christ. Sir Walter Scott, the most important of three letters in the English language, he said were N-O-W, now. Bartimaeus was a blind man. Jesus was coming through his town, the little town of Jericho, and he was blind, and he had that one moment, and he cried out, and he said, Jesus, have mercy upon me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And the Scripture says that someone told him that it was Jesus that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He took that one moment. I believe this whole crusade has been planned and prayed for and organized, and we've been brought here maybe just for you. I told people when I came here that I felt we'd come to Tallahassee because of one person. I do not know who that person is, but you may be the person, and it'd be worth all the effort for you. Because you see, Christ would have died on the cross if there had been nobody but just you. On the rugged, wave-beaten cliffs of the west coast of Scotland, a man was once gathering the eggs of the seabirds which nest there. He'd been let down from the top of the cliff by a rope to the ledge where the nests were. But in a moment of carelessness, he'd let the rope slip from his hand. He knew that the first swing of the rope would be his only chance, and with all the powers of his body, and mind, he jumped for the rope. He seized it, and he was saved. The rope is swinging in your direction, the rope of salvation from the cross and the empty tomb. God is saying, seize it. The Bible says there'll come a day when they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. There will come a day you'll cry out to God, but it'll be too late. Come now. There may never be a thing like this in your lifetime in Tallahassee again, ever, when you're so close to the kingdom of God. I'm going to ask you to do something we've seen several hundred people do in the last two days. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I surrender my heart to Jesus Christ. I want to be sure that I'm ready to meet God. And the first day we were here, the wife of a pastor came. People from the choir came. An usher came. And God is speaking to you. You may be the finest Christian in town as far as people think, but deep down inside you know you're not. You need to surrender to Christ and make him Lord and Savior of your life. Why do I ask you to come forward? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. He died on the cross publicly for you. Now you must come publicly and say yes to him. And I'm going to ask everyone to be in an attitude of prayer as you get up and come. Men, women, young people, to cast your vote tonight and vote for Jesus. You know you need him. We're going to wait on you quickly. From up in the top and all around here, God is speaking to you. You come.
there is still time for you to make your decision for Christ. Just call the number on your screen and talk with one of our counselors. They want to help you. If the lines are busy, write the number down and call later. We'll be here as long as the calls keep coming in. This could be the most important call of your life. So call now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We still have a window of opportunity to reach a lost and dying world with a... From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. To you that are watching by television, this great stadium here at uh, San Jose University in the southern area of San Francisco Bay in San Jose is filled to overflowing. There are a few empty seats here and there, but if you took the people on the ground that are sitting all over the ground, it more than fill uh, this uh, great stadium where the Spartans play. Tonight I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament, to Joshua the 24th chapter to Joshua, the 24th chapter. Now, you that are watching on television are going to see a telephone number across the screen. You call any time during this program or after the program, and their counsel is standing by to talk with you about your spiritual problems and your spiritual needs. And so pick up the phone and call. If you call and it's busy, call again. Now, the 24th chapter of Joshua. Joshua, as you know, was a great military leader. And he took the place of Moses when Moses went to be with the Lord. And the 15th verse. Now, he had called all the leaders of Israel together at a place called Shechem. And he's getting ready to die. And this is his farewell address. And during this address, he warns the people about their idolatry. He warns them that the judgments of God will fall upon them unless they live for the Lord. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to serve the devil, serve him. But make a choice. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, if every one of you serves other idols and other gods, makes no difference. As for me and my house, we've already made a decision. We are going to serve the Lord. And that's a decision that every single person here tonight has to make. You either have to decide that you're going to serve the gods of materialism all around us, or the true and the living God. And Joshua was warning the people to choose God, to follow Him instead of these other gods. And so we have to make a choice. Moses had warned Israel much earlier, a generation earlier, when he was dying. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Moses had said the same thing that Joshua is saying, separated by many years, and every generation has to hear it over and over and over again. And that's why the gospel never grows old. It applies to every generation alike. 
We have to make a choice. Alexander the Great was asked how he conquered the world. He said, by not wavering. And James says in the first chapter, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you unstable about your relationship to Christ? Do you waver in your relationship to Christ? Or are you totally committed to Christ as Savior and Lord? Or do you waver about it? Many of you waver by the way you live. And Jesus warned the hypocrites, people who pretend one thing and live another. This was his great battle with the hypocrites in the church. We have old proverbs that are familiar to us all. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't waver. Make a decision. Do it now. That's what Joshua was saying. And Joshua, the great military hero that had led them from victory to victory, reminded them of all the victories that God had given. And he said, serve God and live. Serve these other gods and you'll die and come under the judgment of God. And the message has not changed. Now the wars were over. But Joshua found that the people were going toward idolatry. And many times the problems of peace are greater than the problems of war. And he had called all these leaders to Shechem. Now Shechem was a place, the most historical place in all of Israel at that time and still is today. It was where Abraham had first settled when he left Ur of the Chaldees. It was where Jacob had purchased his parcel of land. It was where the bones of Joseph had been buried when they were brought up from Egypt. And so he has, there are two mountains there. I've stood there. And on one mountain he put six of the tribes and on the other mountain he put the other six. And Joshua spoke with a mighty voice even though he was an old man. And he reviews the history of Israel and how God had blessed them and how they'd won their victories, not by their own power and their own strategies and their own ingenuity and their own strength, but by the power of God. And the people should have been grateful to God, but instead they were now going to other gods. And we in America should be grateful to God for the blessings He's given us. But what do we find? We find that we're worshiping other gods, the gods of pleasure, the gods of lust and greed and hate, the gods of materialism, even the gods of war. And Joshua tells them that such a condition cannot continue. They must decide whether they want to serve the idols or to serve the living God. And he will not allow any neutrality. Neither does Jesus Christ. And Joshua said, you have to decide immediately now. Choose you this day, not tomorrow, this day, whom you're going to serve. And many of you are going to have to decide tonight. What is the number one priority in your life? Is the priority Christ? Or is the priority something else? Christ demands first place. There's no room on the throne of your heart for two gods. It's either Christ or it's the other God. Because I believe the emphasis must, we must lay it out straight that you cannot serve God and mammon. You must make a choice. And I found that the harder the challenge is, the greater the response. Young people today want a challenge. They want something tough and hard, all right? Give your life to Christ. He'll challenge you because he says you must deny self and take up a cross. He says, I'm going to a place of execution. Come and go with me. Deny your own selfish ambitions and lust and turn to me and go to the cross with me. Now, Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a film showing throughout the world this year called The Idol Maker, but a Christian is an idol breaker. And regardless of their decision, Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. 
You know, Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, if you want to build a wonderful world, we'll build it together. But I'm going to test you because I've given to you the ability to choose. I haven't made you a robot in which I could punch a button and you would obey me. I've made you in my image. You have the right to choose. So when Adam and Eve faced that choice, they chose wrongly. They broke the law of God. And God said, in the day that you do, you will suffer and die. And man has been suffering ever since, and it's all because of that first sin in the Garden of Eden. And man has been inheriting that tendency to sin ever since. The seed of sin is in us when we're born. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Think of it now. At conception, sin was already planted. And then comes the age of accountability, moral accountability, maybe eight or nine or ten years of age, when you are held accountable by God for your actions and you choose to sin. And then the rest of your life you practice sin. You're born toward sin. You choose to sin at a certain point, And then you practice sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned and we're all idolaters. Now, Adam had to make a choice and he made the wrong choice. You have to make a choice. Many of you that are watching by television, I hope that you'll use that telephone number right now and call in and make the choice for Christ and say to that counselor, as for me in my house, I choose the Lord. And then many choices, like the rich young ruler. Remember, he came to Jesus and he was filled with questions and he wanted eternal life and he said, Sir, what must I do to find eternal life? And Jesus said, looked at him and loved him and said, Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Take up the cross. Follow me. The young man was grieved. He wept. He wanted Christ, but he wanted his money more. Now, if he had said, all right, I'll do it, Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have said, no, it's not your money I want. I want your heart. It's our attitude toward these idols and toward the, these things. The television itself can become an idol. When we walk into the room, all conversation stops and we sort of sit there in reverence watching that box <laughs> to see if J.R. is going to be shot again. <laughs> Now, the Bible says we must choose two ways of life. Jeremiah had written, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a way of life, there's a way of death. Which way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only way to permanent peace. I'm the only way to permanent joy. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to forgiveness of sin. I'm the only way to the Father. You have to come by me. And that eliminates a lot of people. When Jesus began to talk about dying on the cross, a lot of his followers left him. They said, Lord, we thought you were going to sit up on a big throne and we were going to drive in Cadillacs and we were going to have beautiful swimming pools and lovely ladies and all the rest of it. We didn't really know that you were going to die and wanted us to go with you. We thought this was going to be a kingdom and we were going to overthrow Rome and we were going to rule the world. And that is going to happen someday. But not now, the cross before the crown. Some of us want the crown before the cross. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What are some of the ways? Well, some people say, I'm going to follow my conscience, but you don't follow your conscience. Many of us have dead consciences. Your conscience is no longer a safe guide. You've hardened it. You've deadened it. And then other people say, well, I try to be sincere in everything I do. We're, we're here on a football stadium right here. 
And many years ago, I saw a man pick up a football and he ran 65 yards the wrong way. Now, he was one of the most sincere fellows you ever saw. <laughs> Lost the game. And then there are many people that say, well, you know, I do a lot of good works and I give money to charitable causes and I, I do all that. I, I'm sure God will understand. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved, through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform, I, I'll do better. I know people that are always saying, I'm going to do better, but they never do better. They don't have any power within them to do better until they come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, an explosion takes place of power that he gives you to live a new life. I can't live the Christian life. I have no power within me to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live in me and Christ has to live through me. I cannot live the Christian life. I'm a total flop and failure. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Few, he said, only a few are going to find that narrow gate and that narrow way, as I said last evening. Are you among that few? You not only choose between two ways of life, but you choose between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism, he says in Matthew the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to make a choice. All the way through the Bible, choices, 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 choices. Not only between two ways of life and two masters, but you're going to have to choose between two fathers, two spiritual fathers. He said in John 8 a very shocking statement, the 44th verse. He said, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. Now, he says, for many of you, the devil is your spiritual father. Now, you're not aware of it. You wouldn't admit it, but that's the way God looks at it. There's either God, your spiritual father, the true and the living God, Christ, or there is the devil. And then you have to choose not only between two ways of life and two masters and two fathers, but you have to choose between two destinies, heaven or hell. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7, 27. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, he taught at both universities, used to emphasize, he said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. And if you want to come to him, pick up that telephone if you're watching and call that counselor who's waiting to talk to you about the way to heaven and how you can find Christ. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, Jesus is in heaven preparing your estate right now, waiting for you. There is a future life. And eternal life does not begin when you die and go to heaven. It begins here and now when you make this choice for Christ because eternity, eternal life, comes to dwell in your heart tonight. Jesus Christ is the gateway to heaven. Now this choice also, you must make yourself. 
Joshua said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your father can't make it for you. Your mother can't make it for you. Your children can't make it for you. This is where you must choose yourself. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within ourselves where we retire from all other fellowships, comradeships, and influences, and there's a lonely arena where the greatest battles of life must be fought alone. And this is a decision that you have to make alone. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live forever. Notice it says thy seed. This has something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your children's children. My son and I were talking tonight about how it passes on from generation to generation, this faith that we have in Christ. The writer to Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice. Moses could have probably been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to all the riches and power of Egypt. And he made a choice to suffer persecution and the reproach with the people of God. He didn't know that his name would be in history. He didn't know that someday he would lead all of Israel. He didn't know that someday he would be considered one of the greatest men that ever lived. When he made that choice, he made it on the basis of simple faith in God. Some think that Guy Lafla is the world's greatest hockey player. And he said a month ago that each of us has only one past, but there are many futures. You see, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. And when you do that, Christ changes your past. He wipes out all the sins of the past. Because you see, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses it from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When He died on that cross, He forgave all the past. You tonight are reminded of the many sins in your life. The Holy Spirit's bring them to your mind right now. And you know they stand against you at the judgment where every secret thing will be brought out. But Jesus tonight offers forgiveness. But he offers more than forgiveness. He offers justification, just as though you had never committed a sin. What a wonderful thing to go to bed tonight and know that the past is gone, forgiven, cleansed, and God no longer remembers your sins. Yes, and this choice is very urgent. To delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision is itself a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Choose now. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise a tomorrow. Come while you can. Time itself makes the decision for you if you don't. You say, but what do I have to do? Three things. You must be willing to repent of your sin. That means to change your way of thinking about your sins and realize how bad they are in the sight of God. Change your way you're thinking about God and say, I love Him and I'm going to love Him with all my heart, mind, and soul. I'm going to make Him the priority of my life. I'm going to put Him first from now on. He's going to be not only my Savior but my Lord. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. You may be an officer in the church but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ and you want to be sure, and you must be willing to repent. And secondly, by faith, receive Christ into your heart. That means you put your whole weight on Him and trust Him and Him alone. And thirdly, you follow and serve Him as His disciple and follower and obey Him. That means a big change for many of you if you make this choice. I'm going to ask you to make it now. 
and I'm going to ask you to do it publicly as we've seen thousands of people this week already come to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat. If you start from that top stand up there, it'll take you two minutes, so start now. And come and stand in front of this platform, and as you all stand here in front of the platform, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. You're making that choice by coming and standing here. And the reason I do it publicly is because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Joshua called upon the people publicly. Moses called upon the people publicly to inscribe their commitment that would be seen publicly for generations to come. I'm asking you tonight to publicly and openly come and say tonight, Christ is going to be priority in my life. I want to know that I have eternal life. And you that have been watching by television, pick up the telephone and call that number. There are people standing by to talk to you right now. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. by television can see that here in this stadium at San Jose University in California that hundreds of people are coming to make their commitment to Christ. Pick up the phone. You see on your screen, you dial that number, and if you don't get in right away, keep calling. They'll be there all evening and make your commitment to Christ over the telephone or ask the counselor to ask, answer your questions. God help you to make that commitment. And please go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelist,
से 